This is Bliss Oasis. Change your thinking, change your life. Yes, I've had uh, several clients. I can say um, it ranges from everything to uh, from uh, mental illnesses such as depression, mm -hmm. anxiety, um, physical. Uh, I've managed people with Alzheimer's, with uh, uh, elderly people with uh, mental degradation. Um, physical health problems, uh, viral infections. Um, what I can say is... Welcome to Bliss Oasis Africa, where we bring you untold stories of everyday Kenyans. I'm your host, Patrick Ngoki. Please subscribe to this channel so that you can be alerted every time we have a new video. Our guest today is Alvin Waiharo, who are diagnosed with bipolar disorder, a mental health condition, as a teenage in secondary school. Fed up with medicine he was getting, Bihara decided to do his own research into natural therapy, and along the way he discovered, or rather received what he calls spiritual awakening. Now in his studies, Avin gives natural therapy to clients with various ailments both physically and spiritually. He spoke to us recently and hold on for his story. Meanwhile, let's get today's message from Bliss Oasis Africa. And today's message is fixing our eyes on the prize. The vortex is a place where everything you desire is already there, waiting for you to align with them. Once you desire something, it starts getting created in the vortex. And the more you focus on your desire, the clearer the picture is created and eventually moves to you. Focusing on your prize or the desired object or condition transforms you from an observer to creator. Therefore, you must, you must only observe what you want in order to manifest it. Focus on what you prefer, feel as good as you can. Don't give in to doubt and disappointment. Ignore bad news sayers and analysts. Stop finding reasons why you can't, you can't, but get reasons why you can. Just imagine and feel the joy of having what you are after, be it relationship, health, or project. Just keep your eyes on the prize joyfully and allow in the best the best image you can visualize the, visualize imagine imagine the best result you desire and practice it remember what you see in your mind is what you get and now let's go to Alvin's Waiharo interview welcome welcome again to this Oasis Africa where we give you untold stories of ordinary Kenyans. And life can be a mystery. And life in a, is a mystery because every time you think you know something, every time you think you know it all, you realize there is more to know and there is more to find out. So that life is always a progression of demystifying a lot of stuff. And today we are going to be talking to Alvin Waiharo a young man who has discovered that there's more to life than you normally see around you. And Alvin is a lot of things, but at least I know one thing, he deals in herbal medicine, but he's also a specialist in what we call consciousness. And what is consciousness? That's a very big question, which he is going to unravel for us. So Alvin, welcome to Bliss Oasis Africa. And first of all, I'd like you to give us your background, where you were born, where you went to school, and how did you discover this, uh, if I may call it, gift that you have? Welcome to the show. Uh, thank you very much, Patrick. Uh, it's a very big honor to be on your show. 
uh, I've, I've been very excited. <laughs> mm, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so my background really, um, I can say that I, I was born in uh, Kenya, in Kiambu County. Uh, I come from uh, Kabete. And uh, this was about 32 years ago. <laughs> Uh, very, very. <laughs> it could be recent. It could be a long time. As your tour time doesn't yes. exist, doesn't Yes, very true. Uh, time doesn't exist, and um, of course, it. I, I would say it's all about how you live life. All right. Um, is is a quality of time that okay. you get to enjoy. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. Uh, I was born, um, so I've grown up in Nairobi most of my life. Um, there's a saying that co it's called Bontao. 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 Bontao, uh, bon yeah. <laughs> All right. Yes. Uh, so um, for my studies, I have done it uh, uh, for primary school. I went to uh, Westlands Primary High School. I was in Sunshine. And uh, for my degree, I pursued it um, in Kenyatta University. I studied uh, Bachelor of Commerce in Finance. Um, I've been a very uh, avid businessman most of my life since I was a young boy, mm -hmm. uh, always finding things to sell and, uh, uh, you know, just engage in commerce. <laughs> okay. uh, yeah. So and growing up, my father was, yes. So what are you selling as a kid? What kind of stuff are you selling? Ah, uh, well, sweets, uh, chocolates. Uh, ah. Ah. <laughs> my father, yeah. Mm. My father was in the business of chocolates and okay. uh, he, would, uh, he traded in chocolates at some point and mm. a variety of other things. So uh, growing up, I really, modeled myself after him. And so I also took part in some business and um, I also used to work in some of his businesses as well. Okay. So it was very interesting learning the mechanics of, of uh, that. All right. So you did, you said at the university, you did the BCom in what? Yes, in, in finance. In finance. Yes. yes. So what happened after that? Uh, well, uh, my career has been a very interesting <laughs> journey. Um, okay. First of all, it uh, took me quite some time uh, to finish my degree <laughs> um, because at some point uh, in my studies, um, I felt that uh, I was uh, not uh, inspired or passionate mm. to work in business. Um, I, I find business very fascinating. And at the same time, I found um, it did not uh, speak to my creativity, to my interest to explore the world and uh, different aspects of life. Mm -hmm. um, so it took me about eight years to finish my degree. <laughs> Which would have taken and how long? Four years. So you took double time, double the period. Yes, yes, double the time. So yeah, between um, between the first year and eighth year, well, if you may call it eighth year when you're finishing, what was happening in between? Well, um, sometime in the third year, uh, in 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 public universities, they're usually very long holidays. Yeah. Uh, breaks of like six months between semesters. Yes. So during this uh, period, um, I used to find work, you know, mm -hmm. just up the uh, hassle zatao, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, going around. Um, I worked in uh, various things such as marketing companies, um, starting my own businesses. At some point in campus, I used to sell women's clothes and jewelry. Oh. <laughs> Yes, um, okay. so I, you know, I would go around uh, the dorms and the and the hostels and um, market and sell uh, mm. uh, to the ladies there, as well as jewelry, um, 
for men as well. Okay. Um, but mostly it was for ladies. So it was a very interesting experience of socializing. Okay. Um, in my third year, I started working in a hotel. Um, and uh, it was uh, mainly supposed to be a casual job, just something to keep me busy. Mm. Um, I recall at the time I had a choice between uh, taking an internship in, an, in a financial advisory company mm -hmm. and uh, I did not feel like that was something I was interested in doing okay. um, and uh, then I got an opportunity to work you know in the uh, in the hotel in the housekeeping department mm -hmm. um, and uh, it, it was a night shift <clears throat> job um, and uh, paid 400 shillings a day oh, okay. <laughs> Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Mm. definitely not bad for a student yes. uh, <laughs> um, so uh, after working there for a few months when I was going to join back school for my final year mm. I decided to uh, take a permanent position in the hotel mm -hmm. I hotel? felt that Ah, yes, the same hotel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In Nairobi. Um, in Nairobi, it was uh, in Westlands. Okay. It's still there. It's uh, the Sankara Hotel. Oh, yes. Um, the one in Westlands. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. yeah. That, um, was, that, so was was, during, that was during your third year. During your after my third year. Oh, after yes, your Yes. Okay. Yes. And so between my third year and my fourth year. Mm. Mm, yeah. So I felt one thing I enjoyed very much about uh, working there mm -hmm. was, uh, you know, as a student, uh, most of uh, time is spent in school on campus. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this, of course, is um, where you read and you prepare and, um, you know, just have a student life, um, mm -hmm. socializing, parties, mm -hmm. um, all those different kinds of things. And uh, I felt I could do more, I could be more, I could experience more mm -hmm. in life. And uh, it was not necessary for me to go through the normal route mm -hmm. um, that we are told that is uh, the best way to go of, you know, finish school, get your degree, then get a job. And uh, then, you know, life will, life will be okay. Mm. And uh, for myself, I always felt um, there is more to experience in life, and it doesn't have to be in this linear manner. Of there's there's like a script that right. is out there that you mm. need to follow. Um, so uh, working there, I really enjoyed myself. I got to meet a lot of different kinds of people. Mm. Um, most of the hotel staff were between five to 10 years, my senior. So interacting with them really opened up my mind uh, mm -hmm. to many different realities of the world mm -hmm. um, that gave me a lot of sense of direction about myself mm -hmm. and what I wanted in life. Mm -hmm. um, so just before I joined for my fourth year semester, mm -hmm. I, I decided to take up a permanent position and apply for a position in the front office. Mm. And uh, fortunately I got the position. And uh, this was perfect for me because here I got to interact even more with guests and people from all around the world mm. and uh, challenge myself to adapt because you know, finance and accounting, um, they're very, let's say introverted work. You know, This okay. is administration. Mm. You're in the back office, all you're doing is handling numbers and Excel sheets, <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> you know, uh, counting, counting, counting. And mm. um, uh, for me, it was a very different experience in the front office because yeah. it pushed me to be more sociable. Okay. I had to learn, uh, you know, um, interpersonal skills. I had mm. to learn uh, how to be receptive and to 
um, have listening skills, mm -hmm. how to market, how to problem solve for glass. Mm -hmm. So I really got to expand myself uh, um, on a personal development level. Okay. And uh, uh, while doing this now, th this is where my, my degree now took a break and uh, for another three and a half years. Wow. <laughs> yes. Okay. So you mean yeah. for three years you remain at the hotel or you did, did you do something else? Uh, for four years, actually, um, I remained at the hotel. At the same position? Um, I worked. Uh, no, no, not at the same position. I started yeah. working as a bellboy. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so the guy at the hotel who comes and he receives you, he takes up your luggage, he welcomes you and takes you to the reception. All right. Once you check, uh, he, ex uh, he escorts you up to the room. All right. Um, yeah, I, I took this position specifically because it was in the front office. So mm -hmm. I would get to interact one-on-one -on -one with guests. Mm -hmm. There were other positions in the back office for mm -hmm. administration, mm -hmm. uh, which I felt uh, would not give me as much exposure as I wanted. Oops, sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah yeah so so yes yes um then um after about eight months mm -hmm. i was promoted to guest relations right. which is um concierge so mm -hmm. that's where i spent about three years of my time in sankara mm -hmm. guest relations is more about being the pr for the hotel mm -hmm. um so this is um the liaison for guests who are in the hotel mm. to uh, find out how they're doing, manage the quality of their stay, um, intervene between the guests and the other departments such as housekeeping, restaurant uh, management to address any concerns or issues, take care of any special needs that guests might have okay. um, to handle and uh, uh, be uh, the communication point with VIP guests as well mm. who come in and uh, just generally to deal with um, anyone who's interested in the hotel, showing them around mm. um, and encouraging them to come and enjoy a stay. Mm. Um, yeah. So, so um, by the time you are going back for, the, for your fourth year, you're taking like three years, isn't it? In the hotel. Yes. Yes. What, what made you uh, decide to go back to school and complete? Because mm -hmm. perhaps maybe you would have remained there and, or gone, done other things. Uh, well, what made me go back, why I decided to go back, mm -hmm. first of all, was I had, uh, I had a near-death experience. Uh, during that year, where at the hotel, um, uh, on my way to work. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> yes. Okay. I think um, one. Okay, how I can explain it was one of the reasons why I joined the hotel. Um, we had uh, previously spoken about my my history with mental health. Yes, um, yes, we had you, yeah, yes, we had. Uh, yes. So, a part of uh, being in the hotel was to, it was like a journey of healing for me. Mm. Um, I guess we can go into the history later. Um, yes, yes, we, we can go to the history later, but it, was that the, the real reason that you'd like to go to the hotel for healing purposes? Yes, yes. Um, Okay, we'll go back to that later. But what I wanted to know, tell mm -hmm. us about this uh, this uh, near death experience. What happened? Okay, well, um, so here I am. It's it's my third year working in in the hotel. My my second and a half year in uh, concierge. Mm -hmm. I'm doing very well. I'm very adept with the work. I've mm -hmm. been mentored by many. Uh, different managers in the hotel yes. and um, I'm well on my way up to management position mm -hmm. uh, because I became, uh, I was really very 
I was a very assertive person in my job. The reason why I got promoted to concierge was I I took initiative and I started checking in guests in the in the reception. Mm-hmm. When when you get rush hour and you have so many guests checking in, mm-hmm. because uh, most planes uh, from uh, 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 are usually land at the same time, mm-hmm. so you have a lot of guests coming in yeah. you know, to check in mm-hmm. together, mm-hmm. and so they'd be very long queues. Okay. So, in in uh, as a bellboy, I would simply be standing there with the guests with their luggage, yeah. watching them become impatient because they're tired and mm-hmm. they just want to check in. So I, I started checking them in myself. So I All became right. a full a full package welcome. I would check in All the right. guests, take them up to the room, and I got promoted. Right. Uh, so mm-hmm. now at this point, I started to feel dissatisfaction mm-hmm. with my life. Um, for my age, um, I, I was about um, 24 at the time. Mm-hmm. I was uh, very comfortable. I was uh, uh, living by myself. I had become a motorcyclist. Um, I achieved my dream of becoming a motorcyclist. So I used to ride around everywhere. Mm-hmm. And um, so at some point, I took a break from riding and I went back to mm-hmm. taking my tattoos back mm-hmm. to work. Mm-hmm. And when that happened, I had an accident in a matatu. Mm. And uh, it was ironic because the reason I stopped riding my motorcycle, I used to uh, I had I used to get small accidents because of the weather, because mm. of rain. Mm. And so I decided to be mm. safe. Let mm. me start taking matatus yes. so I can avoid getting hurt. And uh, so in January 2014. Yeah. <laughs> At six o'clock in the morning, yes. um, as I was going to work in a matatu, yeah. the matatu uh, had an accident. It was hit in the back by another matatu. Okay. And uh, fortunately, what really happened for me was I shattered my jaw. My, do- wow. my wow. jaw was completely fractured. I had wow. a clean fracture. Wow. Wow. Yeah, yeah, on, on both sides um, of my jaw. Mm. <laughs> So um, I, I was hospitalized and you know, spent uh, about a month uh, recovering. Uh, and I even have some titanium plates which uh, were put in to, to repair my jaw. Okay. And uh, so after this accident, I realized that because the matatu hit specifically where I was seated wow. on the back seat, <laughs> that is where the collision happened. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> And uh, I realized that I was very close. Had I been, you see, the jaw is the strongest bone in your body mm. uh, because of the of the work that the muscles have to do of chewing your food. So mm. it's really the thickest and strongest bone uh, um, along with your skull. Okay. So I realized had this injury occurred to me in any other part of my body, for example, my head, I might not have made it to the next day. I would have okay. gotten you know, like a serious brain injury. So this is a, and, uh, this is a near death experience you're talking about. Yes, yes, yes. It's not like, uh, you know, whenever we hear near death experience, we, what comes to our mind is the floating of the, of the spirit. And, did that happen to you? Uh, oh, no, not in this particular instance. All I right, have had several right. near death experiences. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, so yes. we went to hospital, you were there for, you said how long? I was there for a month, uh, uh-huh. drinking through, yes, one month, um, <coughs> you know, drinking through a straw. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, yes, I was, I was drinking through a straw. Um, I got very fat because I was eating mostly liquids. Mm-hmm. <laughs> then I went back home. Hello. Yeah, sorry, I had a call. Oh, okay. um, so uh, when I went back home, uh, at this point, you know, life, life for me was becoming a bit routine. I had a job, um, I was comfortable, but at the same time, I felt like I had grown into a position where I wanted to see what else mm-hmm. I could uh, grow into. Mm-hmm. And uh, I had so many positions at work. I was the head of the welfare society in the hotel. 
I was the chairman for the Welfare Society, the assistant chairman for the front office department Welfare Society. So I had so many responsibilities um, that I had been uh, put into. Mm -hmm. I wasn't able to uh, go back to school. So when this accident happened and I realized uh, just the thing that made me realize how bad it could have been mm -hmm. in the other Matatu, there's a guy who was seated in the front and whose legs were completely shattered because of that accident. Mm -hmm. It took like one and a half years to heal. He had multiple fractures. And, a, uh, when, it was a very huge impact, apparently. It was a very, very huge impact. Mm -hmm. the, the car behind me, the front completely caved in. And, and oh. th this gentleman, his legs, he was almost entirely uh, crippled. Mm -hmm. And he had to go through multiple surgeries oh. because we became friends and we started uh, uh, mm -hmm. keeping up with each other mm -hmm. in our recovery. And seeing him, I realized that had it been for a very slight change in my been able to to have survived mm. this experience because life is sorry, life is very fragile, and our bodies are so fragile that mm. it doesn't take much uh, for mm. for one to pass on. Mm. Um, and one of the powerful things that it gave me was because at this point I was going through a very, very deep depression okay. um, at this phase in my life. I was, I was completely, when I say my life became routine, I was deeply depressed, mm. uh, still functional at work, of course, um, but I was struggling to really feel and enjoy my life. Mm. And uh, when this accident happened, my whole outlook on life shifted. Mm. And realizing that I was so lucky to still be there mm -hmm. and from the support that I got from people at work and my friends and my family, mm -hmm. it gave me this sense that there's still more in life to be enjoyed. Mm -hmm. um, so I woke up from, I recovered from that accident, uh, got back to healing myself. That took about three months before I could chew properly <laughs> and uh, then I started doing more things I, I decided I'm going to go back to school mm -hmm. I'm going to start a business uh, uh, you know I'd been meeting so many clients who are business owners there and mm -hmm. being given so many ideas is to sit with them and talk with them mm -hmm. for long periods of time mm -hmm. um, thanks to my position uh, at the hotel mm -hmm. And uh, so I decided, you know what, I'm going to start my own business. I'm going to build my own dream and vision. I'm going to go back to school and finish my degree so good. that I can, yeah. Mm. yeah. So the reason was, I, mm. yes. Done. The reason was I wanted to complete, I wanted to complete that journey. Mm. I, I realized some things in life, you have to bring them to a conclusion. You can't yes. just, drop something and say um you know i'm done with it there's a lesson in life for everything okay. that you choose to experience so, so you finished um, you finished uh, yes then uh, and you got your degree yes i i did mm -hmm. yeah Tell us next mm. ah well first of all i quit my job <laughs> before you went back to uh, college while uh, while I was back in college. I okay. went back while I was still working. All right. And uh, it was very hard to balance the two. Mm -hmm. uh, I would find I'm missing exams, I'm missing, I'm missing cuts because mm -hmm. of fulfilling my duties at work. Mm -hmm. and, uh, one day I was talking to a lecturer. I had missed his cuts for economics, one of my least favorite subjects. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, I told him my situation. I told him I missed your cut because of work. He told me, look, my friend, you have to decide. Do you want a degree or do you want a job? Mm -hmm. And uh, he told me this. I sat back and I went like, wow, that's such a profound question. Yeah. This job that I have is only one phase in my life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, I love the job yeah. uh, at the same time. I have this goal. 
of to finish this journey that I started in university. Mm. And uh, so uh, I, I, I took a break from work, I resigned. Mm. And I agreed with my bosses that once I finish my degree, if I feel I, I'm ready to come back to work, uh, there'd be a position ready for me. Um, so at the end of 2014, I now I was I was unemployed uh, as of November 2014. Mm -hmm. Went back, did my my exams for that semester, and yes. Um, so now I was on my own, trying to start a business um, with my friends from campus, and uh, at the same time trying to finish my degree. Mm -hmm. it, it took me another year to complete it. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, and uh, through this year, I had a lot of amazing changes and spiritual experiences that uh, we can talk more about. Mm. Yes. So you finish, uh, you got your degree, did you go to work? Or, or you, 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 are, you are now already in business, or you started your business with your friends? Well, um, the business that I started, unfortunately, did not succeed, <laughs> uh, mostly because of um, our vision did not have the foundation uh, mm -hmm. to help it uh, go for the long term. Mm -hmm. So I put in a lot of energy for the first six months of uh, 2015. Mm -hmm. And I learned and gained a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And at some point, um, I chose to let it go because okay. uh okay and it's, now it's, it's and now eventually as I know and the way I discovered you eventually you are a herbalist you have yes. to tell us how you became one how do you learn about herbalism but before you mm -hmm. go there maybe it's now it's time to tell us uh, what you mentioned earlier on about your challenges in mental health what had happened to you so that, you know, whatever happened, happened, and then you take it from there. Ah, okay. <clears throat> yes, that's definitely important to share for this uh, direction. So for myself, um, I was diagnosed uh, with a mental disorder uh, in my teenage years. When I was 16 years old, um, yeah. this was the beginning of my experience of uh, mental health challenges, I began to experience um, depressive episodes. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was taken to a psychiatrist by my parents and I was diagnosed with a bipolar affective mood disorder. Mm -hmm. uh, so what, this- what, what is, is that for some of the people who may not understand what that is, what exactly is that in many months? Bipolar mood disorder, um, to explain it, I have to explain how normally a person's emotions work because it has, an, it has a strong connection to emotional uh, cycles. So uh, for, for people who are normal, let's say normal in terms of they don't have any mental health challenges, they're called uh, uh, neurotypicals, mm -hmm. neurotypical. And for persons who have any form of uh, mental uh, uh, challenges, they're called neurodivergent. Okay. So neurodivergent is anything from ADHD, mm. autism, mm. Uh, bipolar, schizophrenia, and it has to do with the structure of the brain, basically how we are wired. Mm. Um, uh, so with bipolar mood disorder, now for normal and neurotypical people, when you have a negative emotion, let's say through your day, something happens that makes you unhappy, sad or angry, this emotion will last for a short period of time. So maybe around 20 minutes to till the end of the day, you'll feel it will create an emotion in you. So you, if you're sad, you just feel sad. And then by the end of the day, you talk about it to someone or you laugh about it and uh, the emotion goes away and you go back to uh, feeling normal, mm -hmm. which is balanced. It's, uh, it's, it's a balanced state. Yeah. So when you're happy, that's an elevated emotion. Mm -hmm. When you're sad, that is uh, 
a low emotion. Mm. Um, to be normal is to be in the middle. Yeah, that's a point of balance. So for someone uh, who is uh, experiencing bipolar as a mood disorder, what happens is when a negative emotion happens, so someone gets sad, uh, it's, it's, the brain does not correct itself. So uh, like I would, uh, when something troubles me, I would be sad for that day. The next day, mentally I've moved on. My, you know, for me, I've decided to let that situation go, but my mind is still feeling sad. Yeah. Two days later, three days later, I'm still feeling sad. And what happened when uh, what happens when an emotion continues unchecked? It changes from emotion into a mood. A mood is now a mood can be defined as a lengthened period of an emotional state. Yeah. So if you're in a bad mood, you know. If you're grumpy for two or three days, you're in a mood. Mm -hmm. uh, and that mood has uh, a combination of emotions, mm -hmm. uh, irritability, um, you know, um, uh, being uh, snacky, such things. Mm -hmm. So a mood is a combination of different emotions. Mm -hmm. So when you have a mood disorder, you find that uh, you have extended periods of being stuck in a particular mood. Mm -hmm. Um, and it can also happen with happiness. It's not just uh, negative emotions, mm -hmm. also with uh, heightened emotions. Okay. This is, there are two extremes uh, in All bipolar. Right. There's uh, mm -hmm. depressed, mm -hmm. so, and then there's mania. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so when you mm -hmm. are checked, when your dad took you to the, to the doctor, you are checked, you are, that's what you are diagnosed with. Yes. And then what happened? Yes, that's what I was diagnosed with. Well, my life changed after that. Um, very, very, because suddenly I wasn't normal anymore. Mm -hmm. I wasn't neurotypical, you know, I wasn't like everyone else. Mm -hmm. um, my moods, when uh, I would enter states of depression, I would become completely antisocial, um, mm -hmm. unmotivated. Mm -hmm. um, I would lose uh, focus, creativity, mm -hmm. when I, uh, as a child, I used to be an artist. I, I was uh, very deep into drawing, into sketching. Mm -hmm. I used to draw all the time. Even in school, I would mm -hmm. carry a drawing book. I would carry comic books. Mm -hmm. I would draw uh, portraits of my friends. And yes. I was also a very passionate poet. Okay. Uh, writing is also one of my passions and skills. I would do poetry. I would write love letters for my friends to send mm. to girls, you know, <laughs> such things. <laughs> that's crazy, that's crazy. It was it was a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, oh, it was brilliant. I I, I so, really, really tapped into my creation and my creativity. Right. Yeah. Mm. So life changed. So yes, yes. I lost all of these things. You see, uh, depression is a very it's called a debilitating disease. So what mm. happens is it takes away uh, it it takes away what a person is it mm. takes away your ability to express your ability mm. to enjoy life yeah and so i was now in high school with friends and i couldn't be a part of them anymore mm -hmm. because i couldn't connect i couldn't be myself mm. and then at other times now I, i'd go into something called mania so now I'd become excited all the time. I would be very, very high energy. I'm all over the place. I'm, you know, I'm getting in trouble everywhere because mm. I feel I can't be contained. Mm. So it became this roller coaster of up and down and up and down. Mm. Um, and at the same time, what happened was my consciousness shifted. Mm. Um, suddenly, I was more aware of everything. Before I was just in the same routine as everyone else. And suddenly my awareness grew because what happens, um, just as I said with my accident, when significant incidents happen in someone's life, like a trauma, even the birth of a child, mm. a marriage, any, mm. a big event, mm. your consciousness or awareness shifts mm. to a new reality where mm. your perspective in life changes. 
Mm. So at 16 years old, now I'm seeing everything. I'm seeing this school. I'm seeing the system in the school. Mm. I'm seeing my my religion and such things, and I'm seeing them from a very different light. Mm -hmm. That should I should only get to see when I'm 25 years old. You know. Wow! Wow! <laughs> That's when. Mm, and you are you are about yeah. 16 at this, at this point. Yes. Mm. Yes, I was about 16 years old. Mm. Um, so it it transformed my life in that I was now not only out of the normal life of everyone else, mm. but I was also having to adapt a lot to my inner battles mm. and at the same time trying to reconcile the world, trying to reconcile what I've been taught as a child versus my now um, forced maturity into mm. seeing life the way it is. And, mm. you know, it's it's very challenging when you're in school with everyone else and you can't talk the same as them. You don't think the same as them. Mm. You don't see the world the same as them. Mm. Yeah, so um, this journey continued on for me, uh, even after high school. Mm. I became a very, mm. after that, form one, form two, mm. I was a prefect. I was in the CU committee. <laughs> uh, from three, <laughs> and uh, so after the shift, uh, first of all, I left the committee, the CU, because my understanding of God shifted. Wait a minute. Suddenly, I was like, "Yeah, wait a minute." Mm -hmm. You said that uh, at from two yes. from three you were kichwangomo, but many from two. From one, from two, I was a good boy. Yeah. Yeah, but from two and three, normally in general, are uh, normally the Chiangumus. So, how different was your Chiangumus to the other the Chiangumus? Mikey. In form one, form two, I was a very good Christian boy. I attended Christian Union. I was in a boarding school. Sunshine mm -hmm. is a boarding school. Mm -hmm. I used to be in CU every night. Mm -hmm. By form two, I was in the CU committee. I was a treasurer. Mm -hmm. Uh, I used to preach in CU. I used yeah. to preach uh, in uh, what uh, the uh, on Sunday when they have. Sorry, these things I've I've not been in church for a very long time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so like mass now, um, Christian mass on Sunday in this church. Yeah. Uh, church service. Yeah. I used to preach there. I used to be in drama club and we do plays and such yes. things. Yes. So, so after my, uh, I was diagnosed, which nowadays I call it a spiritual awakening. Uh -huh. After I experienced now my mental health journey began, I mm -hmm. couldn't reconcile like my religion with what happened to me. It took me a long time to understand why mm -hmm. God would mm -hmm. allow such uh, challenges and problems to happen mm -hmm. to someone my age. Mm -hmm or to anyone at all, why yes. this kind of suffering exists. Yeah. And why when I go to a pastor or I talk to people in church, they don't understand how mm. this can be helped. And it's mm. just um, mm. something that doesn't make any sense. Yes. Um, so I turned into an atheist, you know, I was like, ah, God, you mm. clearly you don't like me. <laughs> so I'm going to stop. So this I'm was going to form, stop this. Business. This was in form three. This was now in Form 3. Um, so when I say I shifted, you know, Kunele Kichwangomo, ya kuwa noizmeka, makuskip class, I shifted completely. I quit the CU, I quit being a prefect. Now I became one of those two naughty boys who is always skipping school, mm. um, partying all the time, you, uh, mm. skipping class. Would you be able to explain yeah. At that time, would you be able to explain to anybody why you are behaving this way? Uh, no, I couldn't because I didn't understand myself. All right. I didn't understand what was happening to me. Mm. Um, so you see, when you're neurodivergent, it's like they say people with ADHD, mm. they're, they're troublemakers in school. Mm. Um, but what really happens, you know, I've studied a lot of these uh, psychiatric conditions mm. to try and heal myself, is that when you learn differently, when you think differently in the way you absorb information, mm. you start to question a lot mm. and you start to challenge 
the teachers, mm. the parents, mm. uh, the, the elders. Yeah. And this is not normal mm. for, for most young people. Mm. As a child, you're just supposed to receive knowledge mm. and trust that it makes sense mm. and uh, go apply it in life and learn further. Mm. Uh, for, uh, for people who are classified as neurodivergent, there's that aspect of always challenging authority not really out of uh, pride or difficulty, mm. but what I came to realize it's trying to understand in the way they can learn. Yeah. So you teach, uh, yeah, so um, yes. Um, so for me, that's what I became. I started challenging, I started mm. questioning everything, my mm. teachers, mm. Uh, my peers, mm. even people senior than me, uh, older like from fours. Mm. And so I got in, into quite a bit of trouble there. Um, so you said you are, you That's said also it, when I started. Yeah. I also started abusing drugs when uh, I was in high school, now from three and four. Smoking, drinking, uh, bangy, everything. I was like, if I'm going to suffer in life, I might as well enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, you said your view about God's leadership changed. You became an atheist. Yes. We believe... Yes. Many people believe, and uh, okay, people believe that an atheist is somebody who does not believe in God. Is that what you became? You didn't mm -hmm. believe the existence of God, or you had another idea of God? Um, at first, I threw away the existence of God mm -hmm. for for a very long time until I joined campus. Mm -hmm. To me, a world where such suffering could exist. Mm -hmm. Um, I was taken, I was prayed for. My mom uh, took me uh, to many pastors who prayed for me and nothing changed. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was like, first of all, the God, the way I've been taught of God does not align with this kind of uh, suffering that I'm experiencing mm -hmm. because I'd go for months, deep depression for like one and a half months. Mm -hmm. That time would fly. I wouldn't even notice it because I'm, um, um, in such a difficult time that I can't even experience life. Mm -hmm. So I, I concluded that there must be no God mm -hmm. and life is just this, it's, it's a meaningless experience. Mm -hmm. And it, it doesn't matter how good you are, how, mm -hmm. I mean, I was, in, I was preaching to people, I'm like, how can I be serving God? <laughs> and I'm uh, here suffering, this is my reward. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay. You know, um, yeah, so that's when I became an atheist. And, um, but this changed later in life. As I matured and I started to reconcile mm. my life and mm. what I'm going through, because uh, bipolar, most of these disorders, uh, bipolar, let me speak on that for, in particular, is a lifelong mm. condition. Mm. What we are told is a lifelong condition. Mm. So for me, the realization that I would be, going through these cycles and, mm. and periods of difficulty for the rest of my life. Mm. At some point, I reconciled that and I had to look for a deeper meaning into it. Okay. This is after a long journey of many, many experiences, drug abuse, um, uh, you know, just being lost, directionless in life. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah. So how did you shift from being what we call an atheist whatever you believe now. And then that's where maybe I'd mentioned earlier on about state of consciousness. But tell you mm -hmm. after you became an atheist, that was not enough. You thought it must be mm -hmm. something else. And therefore you stopped being an atheist. Is that correct? Yes. yes. So what happened? Tell us about that. Uh well, two things happened. First, I had another near-death experience. Mm -hmm. uh, this was when I was 20. I was what? involved in a mugging with my, I was, uh, we were mugged. We had gone out for New oh, Year's. How old were you? 20. And uh, 20 years old. Okay. And uh, so as we went out to party with my brother and my cousin and some friends, we were attacked by some goons who came now to steal from us. Mm. And uh, in that whole scenario, I got cut by a panga and got injured in several places. Mm. 
And uh, I remember when I was, and this was because of course I was fighting back, yeah. Ah. Being Kichwangumu, yeah. yeah? <laughs> so I remember at that, yeah, Kama <laughs> Kawaida. Yeah. So I remember when I was being cut, I remember I was being held down by two people. And then the third person came and he had a panga. And as he was hacking away at me, a bright light. All I remember was things stand white. Mm. And the next moment, I'm still standing. Those guys have run away and I'm still standing. And uh, I'm injured now. I have a cut on my forehead. I have a scar here. I have a cut on my neck uh, that is bleeding profusely. Mm -hmm. I go to hospital. They tell me if that cut, if that panga on my neck had been sharp, mm -hmm. I would not have survived because it just barely missed my blood vessels, mm -hmm. the major arteries and vessels. Mm -hmm. So after this happened now, uh, life changed for me. I started looking for a deeper meaning because I had survived something I wasn't meant to survive. Mm. Um, and uh, I started reading more into philosophy, into, I started now, reading now, philosophy. Now, now. Yeah. You talk about the bright light. It was mm. just a flash and then it disappeared? Or was that just it? Or was there anything else that you saw? I did not see anything. All I remember was light mm. for, I can't describe for how long. Mm. It was just pure white light. And I was there and in this space, I was peaceful. I was still. Mm. Uh, and I came back. And uh, when you came back, I was still alive. When you came back, did you find yourself yes. in the hospital or you found yourself at the same spot? I was at the same spot. Okay. I don't know how many minutes passed, but mm. where I was was much longer than real life. <laughs> ah, all right. Uh, yes. Did you receive like a and, message? Uh, when the light was there, did you feel like a message coming in or was it just light? It was just remember? light. All right. Yeah. Then but you... what I remember, what happened afterwards, mm. Mm. my mother came and told me because she's very spiritual, a Christian, strong Christian, and she told me, she woke up at night when the attack happened and that angels came to her and told her that your son is in danger. Mm. And immediately she got out of bed and she knelt and she started praying for my life. Mm. And when she told me this story later on, now I started, I was like, I, I was like, yeah, I can believe that. As much as I've rejected God and I've turned from this institutional religion, mm. it's like, by the way, how I survived that, it, there is no way of explaining it. Okay. There really isn't. Yeah, I yeah. should have gone. Mm. Yeah. So you want to and, start, um, So you want to look at it, mm. and to, to look at the, the philosophy of life and. Mm. Okay. Mm. Yes, yeah. I started looking at now God from a philosophical standpoint. Mm. Um, I read many books, uh, Descartes, um, uh, a variety of books on philosophy, on, on um, mythology, like spiritual law. Mm. Um, I remember one time in a university, there's a course called a Creative and Critical Thinking, mm. CCT. And uh, when I was doing this unit, this was in second year, there are two aspects to it. First is a critical thinking, is where it's, an, it's analysis, tools of analysis, mm. um, problem solving, planning and things. Mm. And then the second uh, section of that course was philosophy. Mm. This is where they, I met Descartes or Descartes, who says, I think and therefore I am. And so he was describing that reality is all created in the mind. And there was also fruit. They also mm -hmm. studied uh, Sigmund Freud and the different aspects of consciousness, which is the three different levels of ego. Mm -hmm. So you have the id, the animal ego, you have the child, uh, the individual ego, and the super ego. 
Mm. And I was so uh, captured by this, I failed my exam because I was studying philosophy the whole time. <laughs> and the, the entire exam was on critical thinking. So I'm sitting okay. in there, I'm going like, where are the questions in philosophy? Where's Descartes? Where's Fruit? Yeah, where's Carl Jung? You know? yeah. <laughs> it was very interesting. Mm. Um, but so my perspective on God shifted. And so I was no longer an atheist, now I was more agnostic. Where mm. I'm still trying to understand what this higher being that we are told to love and mm. fear and mm. is about. Mm. So my next spiritual experience now happened now in Sankara when I told you my near that near death experience. The after, the accident. Yes, yes. Mm. Um, at this point, like I said, when I joined Sankara, I was still struggling with my bipolar. I was mm. still experiencing very huge imbalances in my moods and mm. a, ment a mental and emotional balance. Yeah. And part of the reason I went for that job was at that time in public university, there was very little mentorship or guidance. Mm. So um, I had no support structure in school. I had no mentors. I had mm. no elders that I could talk to who could in particular understand the situation I'm in, in terms of my mental health, mm. as it's something very, very hard to grasp unless you're dealing with a professional psychologist or counselor or psychiatrist. Mm. So, and uh, still, I used to be a very, you know, I was still lost. I was still abusing a lot of drugs. That was my life on mm. campus, mm. Uh, going to class and uh, getting high. <laughs> and so by my third year, <laughs> I was tired. Instead of, instead of higher education, you're becoming high on something else. Oh, a very high education. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah. So, so when I joined Sankara, I was tired of that world. Mm. After I was tired of that cycle of mm. just being high all the time mm. and feeling like life is out of control. So I, I took that job because I wanted to change my lifestyle and I wanted to seek my own mentors. Mm. seek my own support system seek okay. people who could mm. treat me and challenge me how to be a better person all right. and that's what i got from that job all right i got i was mentored by so many people they came they taught me how to be planning mm. that's where i learned how to walk around with a notebook everywhere ah. yeah even today always have have okay. everywhere <laughs> now tell me um you had earlier on talked me, told me about uh, having tried to, or rather, you started treating yourself because the treatment you were getting yes. all over the place was not helping. Yes. So you started studying other ways of treating yourself from this condition. And, yes. and that's how you stumbled into herbal medicine. Yes. And you are now in the business of herbal medicine and you have clients. Tell us about that lineup. Yes. At what point did you start doing okay. this? Okay, so um, so uh, to start, when I was working, I used to be on a lot of medication. I was on six different psychiatric medications, yeah? Um, I had work health insurance, so I started seeing a psychiatrist more regularly mm -hmm. for the first, uh, let's say, first phase of my life, high school and campus, I wasn't medicated. I, I didn't take uh, medication regularly. Mm. Um, so now as I was working, I took myself to hospital. I started seeing psychiatrists and experts and I started being on medication. But then my medications kept on going up and up and up. Mm. So first I'm given an antidepressant, then it causes me to become hyper. Then I'm given a mood stabilizer. Mm -hmm. which now gives me insomnia. Then I'm given a sleeping uh, pill, which causes me anxiety. So you are walking farmers. Yeah, 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 you became, became a walking pharmacy. pharmacy. <laughs> walking pharmacy. Yeah. I used to take like 10 different pills every day. I'd wake up in the morning, I'm taking like five pills. Mm. I come back at home, I'm just swallowing, swallowing so many pills. Mm. And nothing was changing. Yeah? Mm. The only thing that was happening was I was becoming dependent on these mm. drugs, mm. which means if I miss even a day, I would get convulsions. 
I would have panic attacks. I would have insomnia that night. I would get delirious, maybe lightheaded, nausea. So um, I'm, I'm taking all these medications and, then, and uh, they're making my life, I'm able to function in terms of working. I can show up to work and I can do my job. But inside, a lot of things are happening that are uncomfortable for me. Um, so first thing I said, trying meditation. That's where my journey to self-healing began. I started meditating um, to deal with my anxiety in particular. And I remember I had a moment of spiritual awakening. I was meditating and I was asking whatever is out there, you know, God, universe, Allah, whatever. I was like, what's the point? I'm here, I'm suffering. And uh, how do I change this? I Clearly, I've almost died so many times. I'm not going to leave this earth the normal way. So how can I live life and be happy? And I had a voice speak to me. I felt a presence that came over me. And it told me, your body is your temple. You must care for it. And that was the most powerful experience I had because after that, I came out and I realized for me to attain higher levels of being and a more fulfilled life, I had to take it upon myself to be healthy, not to rely on doctors and medication and such and feel like I am you know, uh, doomed to suffer with mental illness and uh, physical illness the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. So I started exercising, I started, um, I stopped taking my psychiatric medications and uh, it was challenging for a time. Uh, this is now after my accident, yes? Okay. This is after my accident. And I, I'm like, you know what? If, if, if death can take me at any point, I'm going to, find a way to heal myself mm. yeah mm. so i stopped taking all of my medications and i started exercising i started researching on diet uh finding things like uh so i changed my lifestyle i stopped taking sugar i stopped taking wheat products um and i started looking at herbs i started with moringa you know, I, I read about Moringa and how it can boost your immunity, repair your body and many things. And so I just started uh, slowly and progressively doing research on what my condition is, <coughs> why it is the way it is, because one aspect of wellness that I came to discover is knowledge. Information is power, knowledge is power. Yes. And, and a lot of us, uh, myself included in the beginning of my life, mm. we put our trust in doctors mm. or uh, even spiritually, we put our trust in pastors or clerics or mm. uh, spiritual leaders and we don't educate ourselves. We don't, uh, like I would go to a doctor and they tell me, this is what you need to take. And I don't know what it does. Mm. I don't know what its side effects are. I don't know why I'm taking it. Mm -hmm. I just want to get better, you see? Okay. And that's the, the system of knowledge and thinking that our world currently is in. Mm -hmm. And so as I began researching and finding out the medical background, the history, all the people in the, in the history of the world who have also had this challenge of neurodivergent, I found that so many genius people in the world who have influenced the world have some form of mental divergence. Can you give you us know? a name, a few names? Ah, let's start with Albert Einstein. Yeah. <laughs> yes. All right. Absolutely. Did you know that Albert Einstein, for the first years of his life, he was kicked out of school because he was too slow to learn. Um, when he was like five, six years old, he's going to nursery school. He was held back because they said he was too dumb to be in school. Yeah. Yes. And this, I can, yeah, yeah. Even so this of, is uh, even, even one of the American presidents, earlier president. I don't remember his name. No, 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 not, not president. Some this some inventor. Yes. Yes, I don't remember his name. He was sent. Uh, home. He was sent home to be schooled yes. at home. Yes. Yes. Mm. Exactly. 
So what is this? How I can I explain this personally? Mm. You see, if you have like, let's say ADHD, let's assume Einstein had ADHD. Mm. Uh, I cannot uh, diagnose him, but let's say, if he's in school, the way he learns, if you come with the formula system that you are taught in school, he cannot understand. Mm. Because most people who are neurodivergent, they need special attention mm -hmm. to be able to learn and understand mm -hmm. where they can ask mm. to be taught in a way ah. that in a frame that they can understand okay. which is why when he went home and he was being taught by his mother mm. by the time he went back to school he was smarter than everyone than else. else so yeah. you, you did yeah. all this research and did you eventually discover what can treat you or what, what would work for you because Apparently, you're not mm -hmm. on drugs. Those drugs. Ah, uh, no, no, I, I'm not dependent on drugs anymore. Mm -hmm. So, what I came to learn was just learning how to be in balance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So first, I came to accept that I am not ill. Mm -hmm. That is the first realization I had. Uh, that's why I like using the term neurodivergent. I don't use sick. Mm -hmm. I don't use ill. Mm. Um, uh, or disease. Mm. I don't believe that anyone who has a mental health challenge, which challenge I'm using for mm. understanding purposes, mm. is sick. It's just that they're different, they're different and yeah. they live. It. Yes, they're different. They think differently. They perceive the world differently, mm. and they learn differently, mm. and they express differently as well. Mm. And this, the, the real challenge for such people is living in a world that has not created space for them. Okay. That everything in our current mm. modern world is mm. standardized. Mm. You have to behave a certain way, you have to talk a certain way, think a certain way, and learn a certain way mm. that has been determined mm. to be the most effective, you know, mm. for everyone to succeed, mm. right? Um, so when you put such people in such a system, they will fail to succeed because mm. they cannot, they're literally unable mm. to conform mm. to this way of this standardization, mm. which I don't think is evil in particular. It's just that uh, everything in the world must have balance. Sure, so sure. as much as you have this system mm. that caters for the bulk of the population, mm -hmm. it's also important to recognize that, that not everyone is the same. Yes. And so there should be provision mm -hmm. for persons who think, who are different mm -hmm. in terms of the way they are. Mm -hmm. They're not special, they're not mm -hmm. higher than the other or lower than the other, but they're mm -hmm. just different. So, so mm -hmm. yes. From your mm -hmm. research and what you have learned so far, you've been able to control your your condition without uh, pharmaceutical drugs <clears throat> that's what you're telling us yes yes i have uh, to be quite frank i have returned to pharmaceutical drugs at some aspects in my life mm. um, these are when i've had major traumatic uh, experiences that have happened mm. but for the bulk since 20 since my accident in 2014 mm. i have spent mm. so many months years even without depending on pharmaceuticals because they are there to manage to balance mm. they're not there for someone to live on them for the rest of okay. their lives okay. it, they should just come to correct because mm. these are you see um, most mental challenges are literally physiological disorders mm. so it's when I say the wiring, it's the way the brain has been structured mm. that is a problem. Mm. So when you take medication, it's supposed to help balance out any imbalances, physical imbalances in your mind, mm. in the mind. Um, so once I learned this, I realized, okay, even though I have erratic mm. moods, mm. I can still be okay. I can mm. still be in a depressive state. Mm. And without medication, I can live life. I can be okay. social okay and because and of can... it, and because of your research you've been able to discover various products or herbal products that can treat other challenges other conditions physical conditions 
and that is why you are into this business. About how many? Yes. About how many illnesses or conditions are you able to treat now or to manage? <laughs> and do you have many clients? Uh, yes, I've had uh, several clients. I can say. Um, it ranges from everything to uh, from a mental illnesses such as depression, mm -hmm. anxiety, mm -hmm. um, physical. Uh, I've managed people with Alzheimer's, with uh, uh, elderly people with uh, mental degradation, mm -hmm. um, physical health problems, uh, viral infections. Mm -hmm. um, what I can say is anything can be healed. Allergies, anything can be healed with herbs. Mm. Um, anything can be healed with herbs because most disease is, um, is a physiological imbalance mm. Mm. where what I came to realize, even for myself, mm. it's there are certain nutrients I don't have in my body. Mm. And there are certain uh like physical health mm -hmm. aspects that i have to work hard on mm -hmm. um so when i deal with someone who maybe if i i don't really go very much into detail with my clients because at the end of the day the disease for me is not the problem it's what kind of lifestyle do you have what are wow. you eating wow. what herbs are you taking mm -hmm. and i have a variety of herbs that i use okay um yeah so what i can say is a lot of the illnesses we have come from imbalance so nutrient imbalance like mm -hmm. i found out for my condition i needed to have more magnesium mm -hmm. more fish oil more mm -hmm. omega-3 fatty acids mm -hmm. to be very careful what type of foods i eat so no meat no processed wheat n no cooking with vegetable oil I won't go into that, but vegetable oil is not the best, mm. um, especially if you have a mental health challenge oh. or any problems with your joints mm. um, or inflammation. Okay. Um, so I started taking herbs. First, I started with supplements. You know, I'd, I'd go to this like healthy you and such and buy a nutritional supplements, which I found also very costly. So yeah. um, at yeah. some point, I decided, yeah, they're, they're very, they do help definitely. I've tried fish oil. I've tried fish oil, very many different types of fish oil. And they've helped me, they've helped me have better moods. Mm -hmm. Yes, so you have clients from as far as where? Just Nairobi or where do you get your clients? People who come to you from my clients. They're in Nairobi, um, mostly Nairobi. That's where I operate from. Mm. And um, so other than the herbs, um, which are of course a very big aspect of it, mm. uh, we can discuss uh, what else I do. Yes. Uh, before that, uh, 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 let me explain the difference between pharmaceutical medication and herbs. Okay. I remember we had uh, touched on that. Mm. Pharmaceutical medications are first of all, chemical substances. Mm. And a lot of these chemical substances mm. can be found in nature. They're already present. Mm. They're naturally there. Um, and most of the compounds that we take are simply chemical substitutes that can be created in a lab mm. and patented okay. for reasons of profit. Mm. Um, and they have one challenge is mm. that they have a lot of side effects yes. because these chemicals leave a lot of toxins in your body mm. um, and so are not good for the long term. Mm. They do have their function in healing for, uh, uh, for short term illnesses and conditions, mm. but because of the toxin load that they put on the body, mm. for the long term, they can be destructive and create even more problems for someone. So um, the beauty of herbs is that herbs do not have a side effect. Yes. Um, you can use them as much as you want and they won't affect you negatively. Mm. 
which is very important for healing okay. long term. Awesome. Uh, uh, with medication, you'll treat yourself today. Yeah. Six months later, you have the same problem. Well, because, later yeah, or even two days later, because yeah. all you've treated are the symptoms. When I started with fish oil, for instance, and I was doing research, and I could mm. see if I take an antidepressant, mm. it works in two weeks. An antidepressant will relieve your mental system uh, symptoms for two weeks and you'll start to feel better. Mm. The moment you stop it, mm. you will instantly, within a week, you will regress back into whatever challenge you have, even if it's anxiety, medication, whatever, mm. or pain. Uh, for fish oil, uh, I found that within three to six weeks, you will start to see benefits from taking the fish. You'll have elevated moods, you'll have better clarity of thought and mm. focus, um, and uh, many aspects that uh, are indicators of better health benefits. So Alvin, um, you also mentioned to me earlier on about some other projects, you have some other work you have. I think you normally take people for camping or something like that. And maybe it's time to be tell us about that okay yes mm -hmm. yes sure um so in addition to my herbal my research into herbal mm -hmm. medicine yes because that's only the physical aspect of the body there's also consciousness um so we've discussed consciousness, consciousness so yes. in order to change yes consciousness and what this is, what I came to realize, for example, for me, when I think I'm ill, then I will be ill. When I think there's something wrong with me, I will. So that is my thinking, which is the first level of consciousness, the mind. Mm -hmm. So through doing things like meditation, like when I quit my job, I did a lot of deep meditation while going to school and also physical exercise. I became a lot more conscious. I had so many spiritual experiences. Mm. And uh, what consciousness is, is awareness. So what does this mean? Because uh, this is what I teach people and I take them into the forests <laughs> all alone. <laughs> yeah. Um, so some of my most powerful spiritual experiences happened in nature. Like when I told you, this voice spoke to me and told me, take care of your body. The, mm. Your body is a temple of the Lord. Mm. I came to discover that the first level of consciousness to attain is mm. being aware of your thoughts, being aware mm. of your mind, mm -hmm. being aware of who you truly are mm. and uh, realizing that who you truly are is not your gender, is not your your environment, it's not your job, it's not your religion, it's not your status in life, it's not mm. what you have materially mm. or any other aspect. So what consciousness is, is simply awareness. Mm. And it is an awareness of life. So as I said, we are not anything. We are not uh, a lot of things we identify with from material things to positions of status in life to mm. philosophies and religions and even our names. We were given our names simply to identify us from someone else. Mm. So these are things we're supposed to experience, but we are not supposed to become attached to. They should not define our lives. Mm. So for me, through my mental health journey, I, I had to learn how to let go of control of life, to let go of my ability to be one way stable for forever, uh, for, you know, for periods that I'd like. And mm. there are always ups and downs. Mm. And what I realized was this is not only true for me, mm. it is true for everyone else. Mm. Um, everyone gets depressed mm. to a certain degree. Yeah. When, when you say I'm sad, you're depressed. Mm. Um, it might not be as intense as what I have gone through or other people with mental health challenges have gone through, but it's still a form of depression. And a lot of the uh, 
that we have in this world is because of a lack of consciousness. Mm. And by consciousness, it's a lack of awareness of one's mind, the type of thoughts that someone has, the type of emotions that can arise in a person, someone's mind, in someone's heart, type of habits that we have trained our bodies through repetition, through culture, to to stuck to and these are habits of the mind of the heart and of the body so when one becomes conscious which is a very important aspect of healing yourself whether through lifestyle changes herbs it comes from consciousness where you can see okay sometimes i get depressed when i get depressed i start thinking certain negative thoughts when you look at it physically, someone say um, I'm addicted to sugar, to mm. coffee, mm. to you know, to alcohol, to anything, mm. and it's uh, you see as you develop consciousness, you realize that some sometimes your habits rule you, your habits of thinking, your habits of eating, your habits of feeling, mm. they control your life. You, we allow our habits, we allow our, our mind, our body, all us. And so consciousness is becoming aware of this, becoming aware that uh, when, I'm, when I start my day in the morning, <coughs> if I don't have my cup of tea, yeah. this Kenyan tea, yeah, mm-hmm. Kenyan tea. I have spoons of sugar, uh, Kenyan tea, and milk. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, when so, I don't have my cup of tea in the morning, mm. yes, so how then does, I will be angry. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and they mm. do become angry because they lack. Yes. They didn't have enough yes. sugar in their tea, for example. Yes. Yeah. So yes. what? So what happened in this program? Um, you take people for, for a camping for two days, or how, how, how is it all about? How does it go? So, so what I do, um, the best way to help someone be conscious of themselves is to take them out of their typical environment. Okay. What this means is that habits are a result of trying to survive, mm-hmm. trying to fit in and to function and to be um, productive in one's environment. Mm. So for instance, at home, you're stuck to certain routines. Like I said, you wake up in the morning, you drink tea. Mm. And before you drink tea, no one can talk to you. They talk to you, uh, they get an earful, you see? <laughs> so <laughs> if you travel, for instance, <laughs> mm. um, if you travel and you go camping somewhere, you travel to another country, and then now there's no one to irritate you because before it wasn't the tea. Mm. that was helping it was just yeah mm. and then you go to a different place and then you see there and then you start noticing I, i'm feeling irritable mm. but the children are not there mm. my wife is not there to to nag me in the morning the way i always still, felt she nags me you're still irritable. Or, yeah, yeah. And you're still irritable. Mm. Yeah, the, my boss is not there. I'm not at work, so my boss and my coworkers are not there to mm. to frustrate me. But I'm mm. still frustrated. Mm. And then you can stop and go like, maybe I am creating mm. all of this. Mm. Maybe I'm creating it by my lifestyle, but mm. by the foods I eat, mm. by the things I watch and listen to. Mm, the thing you think. Yeah. When you change on, yeah, 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 all those things, and then you become more conscious because now you see, okay, even these feelings and emotions, they're not me. Mm. Mm. And so it helps people to change their lives because when you take, I I can call it a spiritual development session or a self-help session. Mm. When you come and you take a help, self-help. You have just said that uh, people are not what they think they are. People are not their yes. job, people are not their names, people are not their positions. How do you do that? And again, why do you need to take them 
out of the environment to the camp. You said a forest, I think somewhere in Lemuro. Mm -hmm. Why? Why do you do that? Can it be done maybe well, at a conference in town somewhere or in their own homes? The reason for this, mm. uh, to, uh, to explain it more concisely, is cycles. Cycles of thinking, cycles mm. of lifestyle. Mm. So as I give you an example of tea, mm. so when you take your chai in the morning, mm. for some people, if they don't take their tea, they become irritable, mm. uh, short-tempered, yeah? And a lot of times you're not aware that it's the tea or the lack of tea that is affecting you. Mm. You think maybe it's your children or your wife or your husband, mm. or you go to work and you think it's your boss or your colleague. Mm. Yes. Mm. So when you get out of your normal environment, mm. that cycle changes because the outward triggers that mm. you used to put blame on for mm. your own habits are not there anymore and then mm. suddenly you're still yeah and then you miss it and then you're still irritable mm. and you're sitting there going like my wife is not here my children are not here my boss is not here mm. why am i still irritable <laughs> you see yeah and that makes you discover <laughs> yourself yes then you become conscious of yourself mm. You become conscious of your body and how your body is creating this irritability mm. because the, there is a chemical you did not give it. And mm. now it, 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 it is unhappy and it is making you unhappy mentally and emotionally. Mm. And this is the same for everything, mm. uh, you know, like cycles of thinking. When you mm. travel, most people, they travel to relax, you see, because mm. there they don't have to think about bills mm. or um, buying foods. Mm. or uh, commuting to work. Yes. So they get out and uh, then th their brains can slow down. Mm. And consciousness mm. is about peace and balance. Mm. So we live in a world of chaos. Chaos in terms of we're always trying to survive. We're always trying to get ahead in life mm. and to acquire things mm. to make ourselves comfortable. Okay. And in immersing ourselves in this lifestyle we lose consciousness so we are so busy surviving by you know uh going to work for instance to pay for bills and to support your family mm. that when you go to work you don't notice the trees mm. you don't see the people on the street as mm. human beings as mm. creations of god mm. you just see obstacles obstacles mm -hmm. you see uh, traffic you know you mm -hmm. see traffic going to work mm -hmm. you see the makanga who is hataki uh, kurudishia change you know you mm -hmm. see your boss at work as mm -hmm. the guy who controls your life mm -hmm. stops being a human being yes and you see yourself as always in struggle apart from taking this mm -hmm. person out of the environment, from your environment, so that they can discover themselves. What else do you do to them or how do you, is that just enough? Because anybody can go anywhere else, somewhere else and sit, discover themselves and come back. Well, what is I, the teach people, hmm. I teach people stillness. I have a variety of techs, techniques. I use yogic methods. I use a variety of plant medicines. Hmm. And I use talk, uh, talk therapy mm. to interact with people. And I build lifelong relationships with mm. the people that I work with. Mm. It's not just fix and go, mm. like you'd okay. get in a typical hospital mm. or th a therapy section. Mm. This is a lifelong journey that I take with someone. Mm -hmm. So how I help is there's a very, you see, when you take a holiday, you can mm. still keep yourself busy. You can find other things to keep yourself busy. You can you can uh, drink all holiday, you know. You just uh, alcohol, alcohol yeah, or you can that. go. Yeah, people do. You can carry your tea with you. You can carry your tea. You can go on a tea drinking <laughs> escapade. You're just yeah. trying different types of teas. You know, there's yeah. so many types of teas or coffee. Coffee yeah. is another very interesting drug. Mm. Um, or you can be out partying all day, um, or partying all night and sleeping all day. Mm. Or if you're conscious, you can be out there experiencing life. Some people mm. go on holiday, they go, they meet people, 
they talk, they learn about different cultures, mm. they travel to different places and get to know history and mm. the meaning behind all these places. So is a weekend normally enough or how many days does one need to go through this therapy? Well, for the way I work, mm. for the way I work, a weekend is enough. Mm. A day or two is enough, but there's a very specific technique I use mm. to make that possible. Okay. Um, and still there is the, the integration part. So a lot of times when you change your patterns, the problem is not change. Mm. It's how easy it is to go back to old habits, you mm. see? Mm. Um, because when you go back to your environment, you start thinking the same, you start drinking tea at the same time. Backsliding. Uh, yes, backsliding. Mm. So how I help is I don't fix people. I don't help people. Op- I don't heal people myself. I help them to discover the power to heal themselves. All right, all right. So, okay. Yes, I teach them the tools that will enable them to take, be more conscious mm-hmm. of their lives mm-hmm. and have more control over their cycles, mentally, emotionally, and physically. Okay. So that when you go back home, mm-hmm. you'll say, you know what, I won't take tea till, till 12 o'clock. Mm-hmm. You know, okay. I'll take tea, sure, but I'll wait till 12 so that I can look at myself. Mm. I can see how I behave, how I think, how I speak. Mm. Okay. And by always being conscious, mm. I can mm. change that. All right. Yeah. Okay. So how do people, I, they, make, they have to make a, an appointment in advance. Does somebody just approach you and then you start or how do you go about it? Well, for me, um, it's on referral basis. You know, mm. I, I work with people as they come, as they are ready. Mm. Uh, because at the same time, uh, the type of people I work with are already working towards achieving. You see, I am the facilitator. Mm. When I meet someone and they're coming to seek my services, for example, through you, when you take and you tell someone about me, mm. you've already started, uh, you, uh, how we know each other is we are both on a mm. course of self-development. Mm a path of uh, a path of higher learning and healing mm. so i focus on working with people who are already on the journey mm. of healing themselves whether through herbs or through consciousness through meditation mm. through yoga mm. i meet such people and i help them to advance themselves mm. in what they're doing by overcoming the blockages mm. that they have you know this what yes what you're doing do you think this is a calling do you feel like you have, you have uh, kind of uh, reached your calling and that, that's what you came to do in this lifetime? Yes, yes, that is what I truly feel. Yeah. Um, and uh, that's one of my realizations when I look back mm-hmm. uh, to when I started my mental health journey with bipolar, yeah. mm-hmm. um, is I realized that I am not ill, I'm not sick. Mm. I am certain things that mm. I can use to help people. Mm. And so it is a calling and it is something that I do with all the passion in my heart. All right. All right. Do you have a special message to the people out there? Because uh, there are so many misconceptions about so many things in life. And maybe okay. you've been a victim of that, maybe you can give a message before we wrap up the program. Mm-hmm. Yes, well, um, I guess I could put it in, uh, I can tell people, everyone out there, that you have the power to change your life and to overcome any obstacle that you are facing or that you have been battling for the longest time from any aspect, if it's a mental health issue, there's a reason for it. Mm. And there's a teaching that is there. Mm. If it is a physical illness, there's a reason for it. There's there's a purpose behind everything that happens, both good and bad. Mm. And when you can advance yourself, your awareness, your ability to see your world and the meaning behind your world and mm. the rest of the world, yes. everything outside you, 
mm. then you can find the tools and the answers mm. to achieve any form of healing you want, any form of success you want, any form of fulfillment mm. you seek mm. is within your power. If you can raise your consciousness, mm. your awareness of yourself, okay. your true self. Mm. Yeah. yeah, so thank you very much for your message, particularly when yes. it comes to discovering <coughs> ourselves, knowing our true mm. self and knowing discovering the consciousness mm -hmm. because there are so many various levels of consciousness. And one is man, know thyself. Mm -hmm. Some yeah. philosophers said that so many years ago. So thank you very much for coming to this process. And I think now our viewers know more about bipolar, for example, those who didn't know about it. They also they have also realized you don't have to give up hope in life. And there's a reason for everything. So yes. thank you very much. And uh, we hope to be seeing you soon uh, about your healing and uh, see what else we can give to the world. Yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so thank you very much. And uh, we'll be meeting wherever we did, we've been meeting. So thank you very much. And see you <coughs> soon again. OK. Santi. Thank you and thank you for having me on. It's it's a great honor. Okay, yeah. welcome. <laughs> welcome and thank you. Thank you for being with us until the end. Bliss Oasis Africa offers the following services: counseling and life coaching, mentorship in creative writing, publishing and consultancy, website development and digital marketing. Please visit us at our website www.blissoasis.co.ke for more information. You can also call or send us a WhatsApp message on 0722-563-544. Thank you.